Hello everybody. This is generally an interactive quiz that I take within a hall or within a lecture theater, which I have modified so that it can now be shared with you on this kind of a forum. So let's go get on with it right away. So case number one, a 28 year old gentleman came with symptoms of left-sided scrotal pain and was referred for an ultrasound. Ultrasound reveals an absolutely normal right testis. On the left, however, you see a very well-defined, well-marginated hypoechoic lesion, measures about 1.5 by 1.2 centimeters. The right cord of this patient is obviously enlarged. The right epididymis appears enlarged. The left was normal. So what are we dealing with? Okay, do you have the answer? If you have called it as tuberculous epididyma or orchitis, you would be absolutely correct. The thought process being, presence of epididymal enlargement in addition to a testicular lesion suggests infection rather than neoplasm. There were negative tumor markers, absence of fever, leukocytosis and tenderness rules out an acute inflammatory process. There was a failure to respond to conventional antibiotics and this patient responded to AKT. A few weeks later, this is the picture. It has slightly reduced, as you can see it on the left side. The left testis reveals a smaller sized lesion. You can see some healing at the margins where it has almost become isoechoic with the remainder of the testis. And the right cord, which initially was enlarged, has now become practically normal in size, as has the right epididymis. Case 2. This elderly gentleman has a history of vitrectomy and an IOL implantation in the past referred for diminished vision and these are the findings. This is spot diagnosis. You see multiple tiny ecogenic foci dispersed throughout the vitreous. I think you see it much better here. So what are we dealing with? Your clue is history of vitrectomy in the past. It's just not the IOL but remember the history of vitrectomy in the past. So in this post vitrectomy post trial patient that appearance was because of emulsification of a residual silicone oil. Silicone oil is used for tamponade and if there is remnant silicone oil, then emulsification of that gives rise to those bubbles that you saw on ultrasound. Case number three. This is a hypothetical story of a young man inspired, of course, by WhatsApp. There's an interesting aside to this. Actually, on WhatsApp a few years back, a colleague from the Middle East shared this WhatsApp story about a young man who as a prank used his partner's urine pregnancy test kit and did his own urinary pregnancy test and to his surprise it was positive. He shared it on the social media saying hey guys do you know I'm pregnant and that sort of a thing and of course there were a lot of uh, you know uh, thumbs ups and oh wows and things like that until one particular response left him cold. I'm not going to show you an image right now. Your answer is to be supplied by you without my showing any image purely on the basis of this hypothetical story. Coincidentally, on the very day that my colleague shared the story, the day prior, I had a case which fit this particular story so well. So what was the response that left this young man cold? Yes. And that response was, uh, young man, you need to get a scrotal examination done to rule out a tumor. That's right. On the right side, my patient had this focal large, predominantly solid inhomogeneous mass, the left being normal. You can see the mass better in this longitudinal section, color Doppler pictures. This patient on workup had raised serum beta HCG, raised AFP, so markers were abnormal. On surgery, it turned out to be testicular teratocarcinoma, embryonal carcinoma with choriocarcinoma elements. And that is why you're, you know, hypothetically speaking, the positive UPT. Case number four, an elderly gentleman referred for an ultrasound of the scrotum for vague pain, vague swelling. That's the right side, that's the left. On the right side, you see these thin walled cystic areas. You see them much better in these images. There's a large one there, that that's the largest one, about 1.1 by 0.8 centimeters. You can see multiple tiny cells there as well. And so we are dealing with, yes, 
cystic transformation of rigid testis or tubular ectasia, a benign condition, often in men more than 55 years, generally asymptomatic, often bilateral, but as we saw in our case, unilateral. The pathognomonic is the location and presence of epididymal cyst, thin wall cysts, and the elongated shape of those groups of cysts which replaces the mediastinum. Case number five. This lady had symptoms of tingling, numbness in her right fingers and pain in the palm basically. That's the picture of the right median nerve. The median nerve is the longitudinal structure which is more superficial. The thicker structure deeper is a tendon. As you can see in the picture, initially the nerve is widened and then narrowed and widened again and I think this description itself gives you some kind of a clue. This is an image, a longitudinal section practically at the wrist joint level. In the right carpal tunnel, you can see that the synovium is thickened and there is increased flow within the synovium. Using the same setting on the left side, there is practically no synovial flow, that is, there is no evidence of hyperemia on the asymptomatic left side. The median nerve on the affected side, as you can see, reveals increased flow within. You can detect actually flow within the median nerve in, on the asymptomatic side. And in the adjacent synovium, of course, you can see the hyperemia. The affected side median nerve reveals a cross section which is 0 0.10 centimeters squared whereas on the asymptomatic side it is 0 0.06 centimeters squared again telling you that the right median nerve was enlarged so what are we dealing with yeah this was very simple carpal tunnel syndrome due to compression of median nerve within the carpal tunnel the ultrasound classic triad is palmar bowing of flexor at an aculum more than two millimeters beyond a line connecting the pisiform and the scaphoid as we saw in our earlier pictures, distal flattening of the nerve that is distal to the flexor retinaculum and proximal to the flexor retinaculum, there is enlargement as we saw in those longitudinal images. Case number six. I think a description of the slides and the legend itself will give a clue to those who are aware of these terms. This patient had a classic condition, which will actually be your diagnosis. So just let's run through the slides first. This is the asymptomatic side, the right middle digit. These are transverse and longitudinal images at the level of the metacarpophalangeal joint. And you can see that there's a structure which is called the A1 pulley, which on this side, that is the right in the longitudinal images, measures just 0 0.04 centimeters. On the other side, on the left side, the A1 pulley in these longitudinal sections, you can see it as a black band there, is much thicker measuring about 0.12 centimeters, that is 1.2 millimeters. You can also see increased flow within that black ring on the left side, which is not seen on the contralateral right side. So what are we dealing with? It's a classic condition, a trigger finger. Trigger finger is a stenosing tenosynovitis at level of A1 pulley, annular strap surrounding the flexor tendon at the level of the MCP joint. There are further pulleys distally, that is like A2, A3, A4 pulleys, but we shan't talk about them at this point of time. And this results in locking of the digit in the flexed position, leading to the descriptive term trigger finger. High frequency ultrasound allows visualization of the A1 pulley flexor tendon complex. Thickness of the A1 pulley more than one millimeters. Now remember that this thickness can be a uniform that is global or it could even be nodular and it, this nodularity may actually cause something like an appearance of a notch between the pulley and the underlying flexor tendon. Hypervascularization of the A1 pulley on power Doppler is seen in the majority of the patients as we saw in our case and the, obviously you can also pick up the tendinosis or the tenosynovitis of the flexor tendon which we also picked up on the color Doppler. Case number seven. This is a simple case. These are images at the posterior aspect of the elbow joint, dorsal aspect, bone, muscle, and there's some fluid collection with a lot of soft tissue thickening. So fluid, soft tissue thickening, the bone interface. What are we dealing with? See that fluid much better there now. This is the dorsal aspect of the elbow joint. Simple, olecranon bursitis. Fluid collection within the olecranon bursa, with or without 
synovial proliferation with or without hyperemia and with or without loose bodies within an associated triceps tendonitis. Case number eight. A lady, middle-aged, presenting with enlargement of the left parotid region. Ultrasound reveals an absolutely normal and homogeneous right parotid. And there's a lobulated hypoechoic mass in the left parotid. You can see the very sharply defined lobulated hypoechoic mass. And you can see some thin septae also within in this particular case. So you're dealing with even, I first called it as a pleomorphic adenoma, but on surgery, it turned out to be an intraparotid lipoma. And that is why my subtle emphasis on that thin septae, which even I overlooked, it's very rare, less than 0.5% of all parotid tumors. But in hindsight, if you go to the images, you will realize that it, yes, it does look like a lipoma rather than a pleomorphic adenoma. Case number nine, a teenage presenting with left cheek enlargement and you see a hypoechoic area. What is it? Here's your clue. Masseter cysticercosis. Well-rounded, well-defined cystic mass with an echogenic scolex within. The adjacent tissue may or may not reveal inflammatory changes depending on leakage of fluid. It is caused by infection of the larval form cysticercus cellulase of the pork tapeworm tinea solium. It's rare in almost all literature is from India. Another case, this time in the right pectoralis muscle, but an absolutely typical or a pathognomonic ultrasound appearance. Case number 10. A slightly older slide from my collection showing transverse section, showing both the testes, and you see multiple echogenic calcific foci within both the testes. The patient, as you can see, had come for that scrotal enlargement. You can see the marked wall thickening. And of course, incidentally, I picked up these multiple tiny calcific foci within the testis. So we are dealing with testicular microlithiasis. It is rare, 0.6% of testicular sonos, that is on all testicular ultrasounds. Classic testicular microlithiasis is defined when you see at least five microliths, that is at least five of those specular echoes on at least one image. Many centers recommend annual ultrasound in view of its presence in 50% of men with germ cell tumor. But since it's very common in patients without cancer, this direct relationship is not actually proven. Thank you for watching. If you'd like to send me a feedback, please mail me at villain at irad.guru. And if you are interested in the field of artificial intelligence as applied to radiology, please do visit my website www dot irad dot guru. Thank you.